So, you're back for another installment of that beginner's series. What about yeast? Well, you know, we're so glad to have you. And of course, if you get an opportunity, you know, subscribe or, there you go, email and phone number. And oh, by the way, I, you, um, I leave the email open while I'm out here in the shop. So a lot of times I'll get an email and I'll just answer it right away. That's why you get a pretty good response time. Um, I just want to get down to brass tacks here. Let's discuss um, yeast because this is it's one of those topics. Uh, and I did a video on this several years ago uh, with great review, but it's been a long time. And in the basics of understanding the brewing process, and it doesn't matter if you're making beer, whiskey, wine, cider, uh, sock, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're going to need a means of fermentation. Now, what, first of all, let's start this, because we're going to keep it straightforward, and I've got a bunch here to show you. Um, but let's start off with what is necessary in order to have a successful fermentation. You probably got this already, and I've got it written on the board. All we need is water, sugars, and yeast. That's the bare essential. Um, and if you've got those three things in the right environment, you are going to produce an alcohol. Uh, what, what levels, what type, what degree, what flavor, it, it's totally independent, or it's totally dependent on what you use, how you do it. But the basics are water, sugars, yeast. That's it. And we're going to focus today on just yeast alone. Oh, here is... The formal name for we're going to go right to it. The formal name. Okay. Saccharomyces. <laughs> Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what yeast is. That's the family of yeast. You know what we're going to do? We're going to call it what it is. Yeast. Uh, I can't say sarc uh, five times in a row and get it right. Okay, so yeast. Um, now there are thousands upon thousands of strains of this stuff. Um, it's everywhere. Uh, it's probably one of the most prominent single cell organisms uh, in the world. And it's responsible for a lot of, it's on your body, it's in the air, it's on the tree, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, known as wild yeast. Now, humans have had the capability for a long, long time to cultivate uh, corn, wheats, rice, I mean all that other stuff, and yeast. So what we've got is we've got a different, a couple of different variations of the exact same thing. Remember that. It's the exact same thing. It's just variations of that. Okay? I hope you're with me. Now, remember, there are, let's talk about beer brewing first, because we're going to go beer, wine, cider, sake, and then we're going to go distilling. We're going to do it all. Um, the, in the beer brewing world, there are basically two types of yeast. Okay? Two. And i got activity going on outside. Looks like a storm's coming. We have an ale, and we have a lager. The difference between the two really is where they ferment and at what temperature. Uh, an ale yeast is, and most of us are familiar with it, a beer, I, I like an ale, give me an ale. It's normally a crisper beer, um, a little bit lighter bodied, but uh, it's brewed, it's a top fermenting yeast. Well, top and middle, okay? And that ferments, depending on the strain that you get, is the different temperatures. It can be oh, 72 degrees, it can be 78 degrees, it can be 81 degrees. My point is, is that this is a top brewing yeast. And then you have a lager, which is a German term for let's set. Uh, lager, they used to make beer in, in a colder temperature in the ground under in some little cellars, uh, and they developed a strain of yeast that works best at lower temperatures, and it's also known as a bottom fermenting yeast. And that's the lager yeast. So that's the that's your beer world. Bam, you got it all. But guess what? They both do the same thing. 
uh, they convert fermentable sugars from sugars into alcohol and their byproduct is CO2. That's all yeast do. Now, yeasts are capable of operating their, in an anaerobic environment or an aerobic environment, meaning with or without oxygen. Hmm. They, they, it requires oxygen, first of all, to develop the colony to get going. That's why we always say that oxygen is your best friend in the beginning. After fermentation starts, oxygen is your worst enemy. Okay? So, uh, you oxygenate. That's by stirring, mixing, whatever. Just get oxygen in your wort. And that's what we call it for beer. And your yeast will be absolutely happy. They'll run out of oxygen, but then... Now they're in that anaerobic phase. Um, and they will always default to the one thing that they do best. Produce alcohol. Let's move on. Now there are some basics that you just need to really understand. And they're relatively simple. Beer yeast, wine yeast, wine yeast, oops, bread yeast, turbo yeast, cider yeast, uh, this is a little bit strange. It's the uh, koji kin for sake and distiller's yeast. All the same family, but different capabilities. Let's take this one by one. Um, this one's made by <coughs> Safe Lager Fermentus. Fermentus is a company that just makes a bunch of specialty yeasts, and they cultivate these yeasts for different purposes. You have, uh, here's a Safe Lager. This is the 3470. Of course, they all have purposes, uh, but that's, there's a U.S. Safe Ale 05, which is a really, really popular ale yeast. It's an American version. There's the European version, the 04, and these for your crisper beers. Uh, here's a Safe Brew, an S33. Oh, gosh, we got a T58. This is another Safe Brew. Um, it, this one will give you a lot of florals. Um, some of those other flavors and characteristics in a beer that you don't normally get in one of these. Uh, so the yeast plays an important role in some of the flavor profiles. Um, and then we have, oh, of course, Safe Ale WB, wheat beer. You know, your, oh gosh, you know, Crystal Weizens, um, or your wheat-based beers uh, that retain a lot of, you know, what I'm, you know where I'm going. So those are your beer yeasts. And these beer yeasts are capable, they have a, all yeast have a different tolerant level when it comes to alcohol. Uh, any of these will work for just about anything, but your anticipation, your expectation should not be any higher than about, oh, somewhere between six and a half to seven and a half percent, okay? Alcohol by volume. Uh, and that's really, really stretching it, okay? So a really good beer um, from most people, or for most people, is somewhere around the 4 to 5% range. Uh, you, you have some hardcores that want it stronger, and, that's, and you can do that. But these are perfect for that. Okay? Now remember, when you get above 8%, you're no longer having beer. What do you got? Barley wine. That's another story in itself. Okay? So yeah, the monks make barley wine, or they make a real a tap, a trappist. Uh, all those. So that's what those yeasts are used for. Now, you've got wine yeast. Now, this was made by Red Star, and Red Star makes several different varieties as well. Now, in a wine yeast, <coughs> you can expect an alcohol tolerant level if all things are perfect in the neighborhood of around 12 to 14 percent. That's sort of like a ballpark okay and again it, it all it's totally dependent upon what you're doing and how you're doing it not necessarily what you're using at that point and we've got everything here from a QV to a Cote de Blanc for a white wine here's one for a Premier Blanc white wine here's one for a pasture red for a red wine and these are just small satchels these are good for six gallons just one of them Oh gosh, these are 11.5 grams, uh, 5 grams, 11.5 grams, and this is for beer, um, this is for wine. Why do we go through this? Yeah. This is really interesting though, and it's nice to understand everything about the yeast, okay? And we're going to get to why they're weighted the way they are. Now, 
Lal then makes wine yeast. They sure do. They make a lot of different yeast. Okay, EC1118 is probably one of the most popular all-around go-to yeasts uh, for winemakers. Um, it's just an EC1118. That's the number of it, or the name of it, okay? And then, of course, then you've got, oh gosh, there's a KV1116, uh, a 71, 71B1122. Uh, you've got all these different varieties. Now, what, what are these good for? These are good for different styles of wine, you know? Um, you're making a good white wine, or you're making a, a grape wine, uh, you, you want a really dry wine, or you want something that's relatively sweet uh, and that you can manipulate. Um, all, what is also good is that if you're making a really good mead, as a matter of fact, an EC 1118 is really good for that. Mead is a honey wine. Um, and something should happen, you get a stall somewhere, or something. gosh, you can pull out uh, a K1 V 1116 which is a slightly different family um, strain of yeast, um, it, and drop that in there, it will not compete. It will probably just rejuvenate and take over and rescue an otherwise stuck fermentation. Isn't that amazing? It's just that simple, okay? All right, let's move on. Uh, we have a safe cider. Um, and guess what this is for? Y you guessed it. It's for making cider. Uh, the... That's all that's available. I mean, and there's probably hundreds of those that are available. Um, now we go back down, we go down to Fleischmann's yeast. Fleischmann's bread yeast. Now, will it work? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it dependable? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can tell you about that. Now, people, there are people that are have been successful. Um, and I'd say, if it's successful, do it over and over again. Uh, here's a tip for you. You know, the cost of Fleischmann's yeast compared to beer yeast or wine yeast is either the same or more expensive. Totally up to you, okay? It's at your grocery store. Uh, but its alcohol tolerant level ranges somewhere in the 3 to 4% range. I mean, gosh, it's made for making bread, okay? Uh, and it's a lower strain uh, because sugar dehydrates yeast. Remember that. Sugar dehydrates yeast. So when you have a high sugar content and you use bread yeast, you have a tendency to stall it because it'll dehydrate it and it'll stop. Just a hint. It's totally up to you. Will it work? Yes. In most cases, or in a lot of cases. Uh, is it dependable? I don't use it because I can't depend on it. Sometimes it'll produce 11%. Sometimes it'll produce 2%. It's just totally up to you, okay? Now you have rum turbo yeast. I just got one of these packs laying around. I just figured I'd bring it out and show it to you. I um, mean, this is a larger pack. And as a matter of fact, the contents of this one is, oh, got 76 grams, 2.7 ounces. Now, heads up. There is probably a, around oh, 10 to 15 grams at most of yeast in here and the rest of it is yeast nutrient and what they call DP diammonium phosphate um, and and some other things some dead yeast holes and things like that. that's what makes it a turbo yeast uh, because it just gives it a whole lot of energy a lot of free amino nitrogens they call fan you'll hear that term every once in a while you just need to understand these terms because all it is is someone else trying to sound super smart it's that simple Okay, so that's your turbo yeasts. And remember, one of these is good for like a six, seven gallon bucket. Just dump the whole thing in there. Then, of course, you have what we call daddy. Distillers active dry yeast. All together is D-A-D-Y. Distillers active dry yeast is daddy. So you'll hear me use the term, ah, daddy yeast. And a lot of people will look, they're daddy yeast. You can look it up on the internet. Amazon carries it. Most of your brew shops carry it. Some of your brew shops carry it. There are shops out there that will not discuss distillation with you whatsoever. That's to their detriment. Oh, but whatever. Okay, <clears throat> this is Distiller's Active Dry Yeast. It looks the same. It is the same, but it is a different culture. It is developed and designed to uh, have a tolerant level up to around 18%, just like champagne yeast. You know? 
You've heard that before. You know, throw some champagne yeast in there, that'll fix it. Well, you better believe it. Uh, champagne yeast will fix it. Uh, no flavor profile to speak of, um, but it'll fix it. But the Stiller's Active Dry Yeast will also make beer. It'll make wine. It'll make cider. It'll make whiskey. <coughs> in short, beer yeast will make beer, will make wine, will make cider, could potentially make whiskey. Wine yeast can do the same thing. Um, it's all in how you manipulate and how you do what you're doing. You know, you know, controlling your environment, making sure you're aerated, making sure you have enough nutrients, free amino nitrogen, diammonium phosphate. Uh, those are the chemicals you don't absolutely have to have, but they're just nice to have. I mean, come on. All right. Uh, I wanted to cover one more thing. Uh, in this, in, this is, again, this is one of those, you, a basic understanding of the yeast, the yeast properties, and what you have. Uh, why do we have 11.5 grams in here? Well, that, because that's equivalent to about, ooh, somewhere around 15 to 18 billion, hmm, billion uh, yeast cells. Okay? Individual organisms. And they're all dry. They're, they're shelf stable. Uh, and then when you hydrate them, you do it one or two ways. You can pour it directly into the bucket or... You can get happy and use some of that and put it in a saucepan, put it in there or a jar and watch it grow a little bit and then pour it back in there. It, either way, it, it'll work. Um, with 15 billion to start with, um, you, what you're trying to do is develop a yeast colony. Okay? And an active yeast colony, uh, remember that a, a yeast is a living organism, so it has a chronological life as well as it has a reproductive life. And its reproductive lifespan is normally around 20, 17 to 22, meaning that an individual yeast cell can produce 17 to 22 daughter cells before it becomes too old and decrepit uh, and can no longer produce, so it kind of drops out. It becomes fodder and food for others. Okay? Um, that's, that's it in a, in a nutshell. I mean, there's a lot of science behind that, but that's really all we need to understand. So you start with 15 billion, and if you start using the numbers, man, I mean, it, it's, uh, there's more zeros you can shake a stick at. Uh, five grams? What's that tell us? If we've got 11.5 here, we've got five grams here, well, that just tells us that this is a little bit more active uh, because you, it develops a yeast colony in about the same amount of time this does. Um, you've got, see, you, there's your difference in your strains. Um, your strains are developed uh, as a sub root of this to do different things, okay? Um, oh, and last but not least, when I use Daddy, um, yeah, there's a good, a good 30, 35 grams. Uh, you, know, you know what George's answer is? One heaping tablespoon. That does it. I use a heaping tablespoon of daddy yeast. Then I use two tablespoons of yeast nutrient made by Firmax. Same thing. And I don't care who makes it. It's all the same thing. So one, of, one yeast, two yeast nutrient, and about a half a tablespoon of diammonium phosphate. Guess what I just made? I just made me my own turbo yeast. So, now, oh, let's do some numbers real quick, okay? These, run, these can run you anywhere from 6 to 12 bucks, depending on what you'll pay for it. Uh, a pound of uh, Daddy Yeast, which is, runs about, oh, about 20 bucks, um, and then uh, two pounds of yeast nutrient will run you somewhere around 20 bucks, and then a bag of diammonium phosphate, uh, D, uh, DP, uh, DAP, uh, will run you about 12 bucks. And you put all that together, you, you know, you're still under, I want that, 30 bucks. Whatever the case may be. But you can make up to 50 packets of turbo yeast uh, on your own. It, it's, again, those totally up to you. All right. Uh, remember, we already covered equipment. And I wanted to hit this one real quick. This is the hydrometer. This is a beer wine hydrometer. But guess what? It works with spirits as well. Uh, because the basis of water, sugars, yeast are all the same no matter what you're making. And you measure it the same way no matter what you're making.
The only difference is that if you're distilling, after the distillation process, you will use what is known as a proof and trail hydrometer, and that's because the resulting liquid is so thin, because it's such a high concentration of alcohol, that here's how the scales work out. This scale will stop here, right below the level of water. This scale, which is the proof and trail hydrometer, will go from water and keeps going thinner, thinner, and thinner. So this will not work when you need this. This will not work when you need this. It doesn't matter how many times I say that. Somebody's going to get in trouble. <laughs> and oh, by the way, it's good to have two of them because you'll put one down, it'll roll off and break. So as soon as you got two, you'll have two forever. It, I don't know, that's just, it's something I've picked up. I've got two or three of these, I break them. They just won't. As soon as I got one, it's gone. All right, and uh, of course, a cylinder is nice to have. Uh, so you can put your wart, your lees, or your mash. You see, we even use different terminology depending on what we're doing. Uh, it's all the same thing. It's just different terms. Uh, and we borrow terms from each other. You know, beer brewers borrow terms from wine makers. Wine makers borrow terms. It, it, it all makes sense. Uh, this is a, a electro digital uh, pH meter. Um, and this is in order to adjust the pH. And the pH in word, don't let that scare you, please. pH is just a measurement of alkalinity or acidity. Seven is the middle. Zero is acidic. Fourteen is alkaline, okay, or called base. All right. Water city water is normally around the seven, seven point five. Um, yeast love acidic areas. Oh, they love these, and plus it prevents any other bacteria from growing. Interesting. So uh, for whiskeys, you're looking at a five point two is a real, real good sweet spot. Beers somewhere around six. Uh, that really works well. And there are some wines that the acidic level is 3.2. But all you got to do is look those up. It'll, it'll tell you that. Um, but, but by and large, just make sure you're below 7 because that puts you in the acidic category, which makes the environment more healthy for your yeast. Oh, as we get through this, we covered the airlocks. A triple, a three-piece, and the double bubble. Self-explanatory, you put water in up to the line and it allows CO2, one of the byproducts of yeast, to escape and it doesn't allow oxygen to get back in. Remember, oxygen is your worst enemy after fermentation begins. And of course your three-piece, which is, does the same thing, you just fill it up to the line and that centerpiece will bounce up and down, allowing CO2 to escape. Wow, I've covered a lot of information and I know that, but it's important that you're armed with this information so that you can step forward and unlock the secrets of whatever brewing process uh, that you're interested in. So there should no longer be that mystery of yeast. What type of yeast do you use? How do I use it? Where do I get it from? Well, bread yeast, it, it, it is all the same thing. I just want you to know that there are different purposes for different yeasts that have different alcohol tolerant levels for your purposes. So that's all I can offer you right now. Hey look, you stay tuned and uh, we're gonna go to the next one. As a matter of fact, we're gonna probably cover sugars on our next video because that's another important aspect of making I, a wart, a lees, a mash, whatever the case may be. They're all the same. That's what I like to, I, that's what I love. So, I have so much love for this hobby and sharing it with you makes it that much more enjoyable. Happy distilling, or wine making, or beer brewing, or cider making. You know the routine. We'll see you on the next one.